Welcome back to the Nimzo Indian Masterclass that I am doing. This is now chapter five of the Masterclass, and we are going to continue our investigation of the classical system, which is queen to c2. Now, as a reminder, we played d5, and in the last chapter, we looked at a3, which is by far the most logical and common idea that white has, because the whole point of queen to c2 is to defend the knight with a piece, and therefore prepare a3, so when we take, they can recapture with the piece and get the uh, advantage of the two bishops while maintaining a solid pawn structure. So a3 is by far the most logical, but by playing d5, we also give them the chance to take, um, remove the tension, and then play a3, or then play something else. And so taking is certainly something that is very obvious and something we should consider because especially at lower levels, but frankly at all levels, I am sure that you are going to see this if you get these sort of positions uh, a lot. So, c takes d5, and this happens to be one of my favorite chapters because the ideas are very fresh and creative and not so intuitive, and, and I find uh, the moves to be really fun. Here, what we're going to do is play queen takes d5, which is not so natural, because what is common is to take with the pawn, to maintain a good pawn structure, um, and then continue something like this. And this is fine. By taking with the queen, it might seem like first we're getting into some unnecessary trouble with the knight, um, which might not be so comfortable. And second of all, we're kind of removing the pressure and control we had in the center. So what are we doing? Well, a few things. About that first point of the knight being able to take us, when they do, we're going to be prepared, and especially because of the weaknesses of this pawn and a very creative idea that you will see, it is hard to take advantage of this queen. Very often, the queen coming out with the certain conditions that uh, are on the board is good for us in this specific position. The second point about us not having enough control in the center, well, that we're going to deal with with two main moves. The main move we're going to play, and you're going to see so often, is c5. We're going to try this as much as we can and whenever possible. However, sometimes it's more advantageous for specific reasons to play knight c6 quickly. And in those positions, we're going to go e5. So either way, we're going to get back control in the center and... Um, it's not that big of an issue for us whatsoever. So very exciting, very cool strategical idea. Let's see how this actually pans out with some real examples. We're going to look at namely three potential moves they have. Knight f3, pawn to e3, and pawn to a3. Now pawn to a3 I think is the most logical because they, as White's perspective, they were trying to play a3 originally. We played d5. They were thinking, okay, let's just take and then continue with our plan. So a3 is definitely, in my opinion, the most logical, but we're actually going to start with knight to f3 because I want to show you a cool idea quickly. So knight to f3, we're going to continue with queen to f5. They defended the pawn, and it's true, our queen is less safe here because of the uh, inevitable bishop d2 that will come. So we go queen f5. We take our queen out of danger, and we uh, offer a queen trade. Now, if they take... To the blind eye, this seems very bad, this pawn structure, but we have great uh, positional ideas. First of all, we have a wonderful light square bind with the potential of playing g6 um, and then having all these pawns on light squares. We're going to control this uh, square here on e6. With the idea of going c6, we're going to control d5. The bishop is going to land on e6. I mean, the light squares is ours. Uh, additionally, we're not going to forfeit the dark squares. When they play a3, it's true that uh, we can take and they can't recapture with the piece, but they can recapture with the pawn and they're still going to have these two pawns no longer be weak. And so we don't want to take. We actually are going to move the bishop back somewhere, typically uh, to maintain good dark square control as well. And then as for this knight, because it's not going to develop via c6, we're going to develop our bishop and then develop the knight via d7 and also use the light square advantage we have to help our knight and castling. So a very nice position. Now what I'm going to do now is show you a game example, uh, which is one possible way to continue 
by playing this. Because there's a million ways white can go about developing, so I think it's good to look at this game example. Now, one of the things you're going to notice is white doesn't, uh, sorry, black does not play exactly like I mentioned. The way I talked about is one potential move, but it's not the only. And for example, f6 is a very nice way uh, to balance and get more dark square control, specifically this knight can't come in. Additionally, this bishop coming to d7 is an alternative way to develop when the bishop coming to e6 is just going to be stuck because we already traded off the knights. It's better to have this flexibility where the bishop is more open. Uh, moreover, you're going to see this pawn launching here instead of going to g6. Again, to get more dark square control and try to harass these pieces with the potential of continuing with g4. So, you don't have to play exactly like I talked about. There's many ways to play these sort of positions, um, but that's exactly what makes them so fun. You can really turn on your creative uh, hat, put on your creative hat and, and try uh, a magnitude of different ideas, all of which are going to be very good for you. So here we see uh, this uh, pawn structure, which is bad for them, where our king can come in, this beautiful pawn here, and I'll just show a couple more moves. We have this trade, um, and eventually the bishop has to trade itself off, and unfortunately these pawns, although they look good, are nowhere near uh, quick enough. The rook slides away, and now none of these pawns, the potential of going here is too slow, and this pawn is going to promote. It's game over. So that is uh, one of the fun sort of positions that you can get um, playing this queen to f5 idea. They don't have to take, though, and they can go queen to d1 instead, um, forcefully putting the queens on the board, but now the queen here is very happy. And we're going to continue bishop d7 and bishop to b5. This was a, an important maneuver to do in a timely manner because otherwise the, the queen will get kicked away and it will become very... Um, unfortunate for us. And so we want to trade the bishops off just in time so we can uh, keep our queen active. Eventually, they're going to have to uh, allow us to trade because otherwise the queen was stopping them from castling, if you noticed, in that position. So they have to trade off. And there's no complaining here. Our pawn structure is as solid as it can get with, again, good uh, spots for the knights to go. And at some point, uh, through careful preparations, we're going to be able to either go for c5 or alternatively e5. Alrighty, so that is queen to f5 ideas after knight to f3. We're going to now look at e3, which is another potential move they have. Here we're going to strike with c5. Notice queen to f5 does not work anymore because of bishop d3, and that is your signal to instead uh, go for the other idea of taking back the control in the center, and here that means c5. Now, they have several options. If they go a3, we take take and develop our knight and, uh, you know, they can go knight f3 and then we're just going to castle. We can trade in the center and develop our knight. We can uh, play e5 to get our bishop involved um, through e6. This is a creative idea and approach as well, trying to force their bishop to stay here. And if they push, they give some certain squares like c3. Um, and after e4 and bishop to d7, we can trade off the pieces. I know I'm going through this relatively fast uh, because, again, this is kind of a game type of example, but uh, you can see that we have very little problems um, and that ending was definitely not worse for us. And so we're happy to go into these sort of positions where we regain control in the center with c5 and then trade in the center uh, some pieces. They can alternatively and take at some point, but then we're happy to just take back, and of course there's no issues there whatsoever. And so instead of a3 uh, after c5, and again as a recap, they went e3 here, we go c5, and now they can play, for example, d take c5. We're going to take, develop our knight, and castle. There's no issues here, again, for us. We can now develop this bishop through this diagonal. Alternatively, sometimes we can try to still go and insist that the bishop develops here, but there's no reason not to develop the bishop through here. Uh, this is a very long diagonal. 
In some cases, it will force their pieces into passivity to defend from this bishop. Um, and regardless, we get very fun positions. So for example, bishop e2, relatively passive, and now our knight can uh, come into the game. All of our pieces are involved, and this commonality that you've seen time and time again being the fact that the king is stranded in the center. All right, so c5. Now we are going to look at bishop d2, which is a final option they have, not taking, not attacking our bishop, simply developing. Here we have to take, you have to notice the fact that the pin is over, and you have to be aware of the fact that now the queen is in danger. So we take, take, and now develop our knight to c6. It might seem a little strange to give them the ability to take, but frankly, their best move is even to retreat, because um, taking is just not so good. We'll look at both options. If they take, we take back, and this uh, seemingly weakened pawn structure is not an issue at all. You can see f5, we solidify the pawns, cutting their, king, their queen away, and we're going to get good pressure along this c and d file. We can castle, for example, move our king away, and then we're happy uh, to go rook to c8 at some point. Otherwise, the queen can come to the c file, and they can't really do much. Um, you can see even in an endgame, the fact that this pawn structure is not an issue because they don't have the queens or rooks, and so attacking this pawn is less likely. And in the meantime, we've uh, sort of frozen their pawns a little bit. Our bishop can sit uh, very comfortably on a number of different squares. Um, eventually, we're going to trade the pieces off. We can at some point consider taking uh, or pushing and just solidifying the pawn structure. In an endgame with extra pieces, a weakened pawn structure is really nothing to, to uh, be scared of. And so you're happy to go into the endgame, and otherwise we're just going to get too much pressure in the position. So they're more or less encouraged to uh, go into this endgame, because again, otherwise we're going to um, churn up the dial of pressure and really cause quite a lot of um, stress into their position. And in this position, they don't have to take, they can retreat with their bishop, but guess what we do? <laughs> we do what we've done this entire time. We develop our bishop either through b6 or by going e5. We're going to castle, we're going to get a rook onto the c file. This knight often will have adventures, as we've seen uh, on the a file, where it's going to be rather strong. And you just do these things, and we'll look at this game example, and you can see how just by naturally developing good things will happen. And here, for example, this nice tactic allows us to win two pieces for the rook. Uh, there's another nice tactic right here coming up where we're uh, able to uh, momentarily, you will see, win uh, a very beautiful pawn where after they take, then we can take back and uh, the rook can come in via this uh, path. Alternatively, the knight can, in some cases, help as well. But Really, this rook is the key for this position. Um, and otherwise, in the game, what happened, they have to forfeit the pawn, and black, as one would expect, managed to get a very comfortable position. The two knights much stronger than the rook, and here they had to resign because of uh, the fact that if they move, then um, there's going to be a fork. There's going to be uh, this other knight also coming in through here, maybe, Hey, this is just a beautiful position. The two knights, the, the most centralized they can get. So that takes us to our final option of consideration, which is going to be going all the way back here, many moves into the opening. After queen takes, we looked at knight f3, we looked at a, we looked at e3, and now we're going to look at a3. Now, against a3, we're going to take they're going to take probably with the queen. This is the most logical. That's why they develop the queen. If they take with the pawn, we should consider something here. We're going to play c5, um, and we'll still look at some lines here. For example, d takes. We can castle and eventually take, and there's no issues. You know, The queen can just develop, and we can trade off some pieces, develop, uh, and get the rooks as one would expect, as we've seen so far on the c and d file. And... Uh, if they don't take, you know, let's say they go e3, then we can castle anyways, and after bishop d3, they lose the pawn, so they have to go knight f3 first, then we go b6, and 
develop the bishop to a strong uh, position over here. Look at the rooks, guys. I mean, look at this. You cannot ask for better, more cleaner development. And here, for example, queen h5 threatens the knight uh, and ruining the pawn structure and winning a pawn, and then the knight can come in. And attacking possibilities are very much in the air. So going all the way back, it makes the most sense to take with the queen here after a3, uh, queen takes c3. But now we develop our knight. Now, taking uh, c5 here is obviously not possible. They're just going to take back uh, the pawn. So we're going to develop the knight and act, instead target this weakness over here. Now, one might say, wait a minute, how are we going to then regain control in the center after a move like e3? Well, our main idea will be to play e5. And this is how we're going to go for control in the center. After e5, Something like d takes e5 allows knight takes e5, followed by bishop to f5, and the check can come in, the bishop will stop the development. This is a beautiful position for us. Um, and instead, if they don't take and they play knight f3, then we're happy to take ourselves, trade a ton, and leave them with a weakened pawn uh, and just a position that... Um, is at the very least equal. I would even prefer black here uh, for, again, the reason that this pawn is weakened. Uh, we're going to play c6 to stop their c-file pressure and to stop this pawn from moving forward. Our bishop develops, and these two bishops, although the position is open, um, I don't see them being too powerful, uh, especially with the rooks coming and centralizing quickly. So after knight to c6, uh, they can, instead of playing e3, they can play knight to f3, but now we go e5 anyways. This is our main idea. And after they take, of course, we can't take back, but we first go here attacking their queen. If they play queen to c2, we can play bishop f5, and their queen will get into some deep trouble. If they play queen to d3, we're happy to go for this check. And after bishop d2, we can take, 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 and play bishop g4, where by no... Uh, there's no doubt that we're not going to win back this pawn and perhaps even ruin their pawn structure while doing it, but maybe not even. Maybe we can just cleanly win the pawn or take, play b6 to, again, stop their pressure along here. And we're very happy. And uh, they can play b4 after this check, but now we can uh, invoke this nice tactical idea. They can't take because of the pin. And if they take our other knight, we have check and fork. You always need to watch out for those discovered checks. And a final move they can play, not queen to d3, not queen to c3, c2. They can play queen to e3. And here, it's a little bit more tricky because we can't directly attack the queen, but still the queen is in an awkward position, not allowing this pawn to develop. And it's also not allowing this bishop to develop. And so we can simply castle long here to get the pressure along this d file um, and this is a very fun position we can choose to stack rooks all the way and again because of their lack of ability to develop these pieces they've had to waste time by developing like this and then by developing like this the queen is misplaced even if it can't be a target it's harming their other development and it allows us to get quite a beautiful finish in this specific line with mate so as a big recap and i know we covered many moves um Against queen to c2, d5, our mentality is very consistent. Uh, again, we're looking here at the case where they take. We take back with the queen, and to solve our two problems, uh, the first one being the queen being in danger, we're going to look to play queen to f5. And to solve our second problem of not getting enough control in the center, we're going to look to play moves like c5, or again, if we develop the knight first quickly because of the line where we can't play c5, then we're going to look to play e5. Thank you for watching this video. Like this video if you did enjoy and learn something new from it. If you want to continue seeing this masterclass and content like this, then subscribe so you never miss out on a video. And I will see you guys next time. Peace out.